Greetings! Today we're going to be looking at some of the big businessmen or the big wigs of the Gilded Age. And I want to start by thinking about the game Monopoly. Okay, so when you are playing the world's most frustrating board game, think about what your goal of this game is. So as you're going around the board, you're trying to collect all of the colors that are in the same color scheme, all the properties in the same color scheme. And when you do that, you can build on those properties and charge outrageous amounts of money when people land on your property. And if you have the most property and you make the most money and you make the most people go bankrupt, you win the game, right? Well, this game, whether you know it or not, is actually based on this historical time period that we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about some of those men uh, who are going around the board buying up all of the companies and doing whatever they can to build their um, monopoly and their empire. So your graphic organizer should be one um, that says playing Monopoly in the middle. Uh, and we're going to go ahead and get started. So the first guy that we're going to be talking about to guy today is a man named Andrew Carnegie. And Andrew Carnegie uh, owned U.S. Steel, and he's got kind of an interesting story. See, Andrew Carnegie came to this country as a poor Scottish immigrant, and he started working at a railroad, railroad station and works his way up, um, you know, putting in his hardest work and his best effort until he becomes the owner of this company. And see, he's a really, really smart businessman. Um, see, what Andrew Carnegie realizes very early on is that the way to make sure that your product is the one that people are going to buy is making sure your product is the one that is consistent, right? That's what we call quality control. So basically what that means, if you think about, um, if you're going on a road trip somewhere, right? And let's say you're driving through, I don't know, Tennessee or Alabama or whatever. And you're on this road trip and you decide that you want to stop and get some lunch. You want a hamburger. Well, you got a couple options. You can stop at McDonald's or you can stop at Big Bertha's Roadside Hamburger Joint. Well, Big Bertha's is an unknown, right? Like, it could be the best hamburger you've ever eaten in your life. Or it could be a piece of junk. Whereas when you go to McDonald's, no matter what McDonald's you go to, anywhere in the country, you're going to be getting relatively the same thing, right? The hamburgers from a McDonald's in North Carolina and a McDonald's in California are going to taste relatively the same. So this is quality control, where he does everything he can to ensure that the quality of his product is reliable and consistent. So no matter what happens, no matter where you buy it, you're going to be buying the same basic proper or same basic product no matter where you are. Um, the other thing that Carnegie did was utilizing accounting. Um, so this may seem pretty straightforward. Businesses today have accountants, right? But Carnegie's really the first guy to do this. So what he does is he brings accountants into his business to figure out where all the money is coming from and going to. And what he figures out to do while he is doing this is that he can assess where all his costs are and figure out, can I buy something to cut costs? Can I, you know, cut something here, cut something there? And in the process of doing that, he's cutting the cost that he's putting out but he's not cutting the cost of his goods. So he's still selling his products for the same amount, but he's cutting um, his own personal costs. So what he ends up doing by doing this is actually improving um, his profit and making more money. And that's one way he becomes a big player in the steel game. So the next uh, issue that he decides that he wants to come up with is try to figure out how to get his managers to sympathize with him instead of with the worker. So let's go back to our McDonald's thing, right? So the guy who owns McDonald's doesn't show up to McDonald's every day, right? The CEO of McDonald's goes out and plays um, golf or whatever. He's not running his business every day. But he hires managers who run the individual stores. And so these managers are there to try and um, control the workers to make sure that, you know, everybody's wearing a hairnet in the kitchen and 
growing the burgers at the same, or putting the burgers in the microwave at the same temperature and cleaning the bathrooms. Um, and it would be really easy for a manager to start sympathizing with the workers, right? The manager wants to be buddies with the worker, um, especially if they're an hourly manager, right? They get paid by the hour, get paid by a salary. Um, but the owner doesn't want that to happen because if the workers go like, hey man, I can take a longer break, or I don't really have to clean the bathroom, right? Or we don't really have to cook the burgers the exact same way. We can cut some corners here. Well, if the manager lets that happen, the product's not as good. And if the product is not as good, he's not gonna sell as much of his product. So instead, what he does is he gives his managers stock in the company. So that means in the, way for the way for the managers to make money is if the company makes money. So if the managers are only making money when the company makes money, then the managers are gonna make sure that the workers are working to absolute perfection to ensure that the company is working its best. Uh, so that way the managers are really working for Carnegie instead of working for um, the other people that are working under him. The last step that Andrew Carnegie takes in order to ensure that he is utilizing the best um, use of his money that he can is something called vertical integration. So Carnegie runs steel, right? But in order to make steel, you need coal, you need iron ore, you need to use the railroads, whatever you need to do, right? So what you have to do is in order to make sure that you are not spending money on the coal and the iron and the railroads or whatever, is you buy up all of those things yourself, all of the suppliers that you are using to make your goods. And if you own those things, then you're saving some money, right? So if you look at this image here, this uses um, a meat packing industry. So the person who owns the meat packing industry might own the cattle farm, the slaughterhouse, the railroad cars that the meat's gonna be shipped in, the um, warehouses where they keep the meat, the plants, the delivery wagons. They're gonna own all of these things in order to make sure that their costs are cheap. Uh, so again, let's think back McDonald's. Vertical integration means that in order for McDonald's to keep their prices low, they're going to buy the dairy farms where they get their cheese from. They're going to buy the tomato farms and the wheat farms. They're going to buy trucks. If you've ever seen trucks driving down the highway that's got like Lowe's Food or McDonald's or Pepsi on the side of it, that's vertical integration because they have their own transportation. And that way they don't have to pay somebody else to do all of these things. Instead, they own it for themselves. So that's kind of where that comes in. So that's Andrew Carnegie. One of the most important things, and we're going to talk a little bit about this later, um, to know about Andrew Carnegie is he believed in something called the gospel of wealth. So what the gospel of wealth says is that the rich people who are making all of this money have the responsibility to give their money away. See, Andrew Carnegie really believed in charity, right? He saw that there was a big issue with capitalism. And what that issue is, is in capitalism, the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. And if that continues to happen, capitalism won't succeed. So what he says is that people who are making all of this money need to give it back. He invested a lot of money in the arts, in libraries. This picture is of Carnegie Hall, which is still one of the most famous musical venues in New York City. Um, so he's giving this money back and has to give as mo away as much as you can before you die. He doesn't want to give it to his children. That's another interesting thing about the gospel of wealth is don't give it to your family, because if you give it to your family, they're just going to make them lazy. You want your family to work hard, so you don't just give them the money, you make them work for it. It's the same kind of idea. Um, today, other people have taken this business model. Um, Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, the owner of Facebook, all of these people today give a lot of their money back to charity in order to make sure they're investing. Um, so if you think about the gospel, right, that's a religious term meaning good news, the gospel of wealth is that you're trying to spread your wealth around. Um, so I just wanted to show you a couple pictures here. Um, this particular picture is of a railroad yard here um, where you can see that there's all of the plants in the background. This picture I think is really interesting. This is a picture that just shows how much wealth is going on in this time period. Um, look at the shape of this table. First of all, it's in the shape of a champagne glass. And there is a palm tree in the middle of the table. Like that is the centerpiece of this table, right? So you'll notice that these are all men in their fancy tuxedos. Um, the hall is just decorated so lavishly. Um, this really just exemplifies the wealth 
uh, that men like Andrew Carnegie really had. Um, this kind of this idea of the fancy pants, right? Um, somebody who makes all their money and can just kind of throw it away. Um, the one of the ways that people at this time can afford to do that is there's no income tax on the wealth. So instead of paying 30% of your paycheck to taxes every month like I do, Andrew Carnegie gets to keep all of his profits and everything that he's making. Uh, so that's one of the reasons that people like Andrew Carnegie had so much of this wealth. So the next guy that we're going to be talking about is J.P. Morgan. And J.P. Morgan um, buys up railroads, and he bought. He eventually will buy Andrew Carnegie's company, U.S. Steel. Um, but one of the things that makes Andrew Carnegie different from these other ones is he, or sorry, J.P. Morgan, is that he buys up holding companies. Um, so rather than buy, making a business that makes something, that's not what a holding company does. A holding company doesn't make anything. Instead, what holding companies do is buy up businesses, buy up other companies, right? And those companies give some of their profits back to Morgan as the guy who owns the whole thing. So think about, like, if you've ever been watching TV and you'll notice a commercial might say a Johnson & Johnson company, right? Johnson & Johnson owns cleaning supplies. They own diapers. They own shampoos. They own all kinds of things. That's like a holding company. So what they do is their job is to kind of manage and invest for each of these companies. So that's how J.P. Morgan really makes all of his money. The key with a holding company is not anybody can do it because you're buying up somebody's business, right? So that person has to be able to trust you to make good investments. So you have to have kind of the clout to make a name for yourself right up in the front. Uh, so that's what J.P. Morgan does in order to make his money. The next guy we have is um, the Pullman business. Um, so Mr. Pullman made railroad cars. Uh, and what that kind of means is that he would, if you've ever seen some like fancy trains, they might have like cars with rooms in them, dining cars, sleeper cars, that sort of thing, luxury trains. That's what Pullman made. And the way Pullman wanted to make sure that he was saving money is he developed what are called company towns. So basically what this man does is buys a town. And it's going to be the town where they make his cars, right? So the company, Pullman, would own the land. He would loan all, own all of the houses in the town, the churches, the schools, the um, you know local businesses like the general store. He would own everything in the town, right? That's a lot of money. But what that means is, is if you're going to work in the factory and you go and live in Pullman's town, your mortgage goes to Mr. Pullman. The, the tithe that you pay at church on Sunday goes to Mr. Pullman. If you want to buy textbooks for your kids, that goes to Mr. Pullman. If you're shopping at the grocery store, that goes to Mr. Pullman. If you're getting um, treatment at the local doctor's office, that goes to Mr. Pullman. And see, what they would do is they wouldn't necessarily make you pay. They would just go ahead and deduct it right out of your paycheck. So sometimes at the end of the month, instead of getting a paycheck, you might get a bill, right? You might owe the company money. So think about that. First of all, there are some pros and cons to this. If you're living in a um, town, it's really convenient. Everything's right there together. It's all connected. Um, you know, you don't have to make a lot of decisions about where to go and what to do. But there's also that big con, right, that you're not somebody who can just make your own decision. The company town has a lot of control over you. And especially think about this way. So let's say you work for Mr. Pullman and you work at the factory and you're unhappy with the way this is working. Do you strike, right? Do you join a union? Do you strike? No, you don't. Why not? Because think about it. If you strike, you don't just lose your job if you get fired. You lose your job, your children's school, your um, church. You lose your entire community. So if you get fired, you're losing your entire life. So you don't go and challenge, a, if you live in the company town, you don't challenge the company because everything that you are is related to that company, right? And Pullman ends up, rather, like I said, rather than paying his workers, a lot of times his workers end up having to find the money to pay him. So his profits are going to really increase with having his workers living in the town that he builds, right? So the next couple people that I want to talk about here, um, oh, 
first of all, this is a uh, picture of a Pullman town. So you can see all the houses look kind of cookie cutter, right? Um, they all uh, are the same kind of houses. They're owned by the company. So this is what it might look like. So the next guy we've got here is John D. Rockefeller. So Rockefeller owned a business called the Standard Oil Trust or the Standard Oil Company. And so what a trust does, okay, is doing something called price fixing. So let's go back to our McDonald's example, okay? Let's say McDonald's and Burger King are like really close competitors, right? And they are, right? That's, that's not too much of a stretch. So McDonald's and Burger King are competitors and McDonald's wants to run Burger King out of business. So what McDonald's does is they go to Hardee's and Cookout and all of these other burger joints and say, hey, we should drop our prices, right? So that we are all priced under Burger King. Now, you may be like, well, wait a minute. They're not going to make much money, right? Because if they're dropping their prices, let's say Hardee's and Cookout and all these places, they drop their prices to 25 cents. Well, they're not going to make a lot of money on their hamburger if they're only selling their burger for 25 cents. The Burger King is selling their burgers for $3, right? Nobody's going to buy Burger King if everybody else is paying 25 cents for their burgers. So what's going to happen to Burger King? Well, eventually Burger King is just going to go out of business, right? Well, once Burger King goes out of business, what can McDonald's and Cookout and Hardee's do? They can raise their prices back up and maybe they raise them even higher than $3. Maybe they raise their prices to $6 right because those are your only options and if they're all doing the same pricing then it doesn't matter they basically hold a monopoly on that so again companies in the same industry get together and make a deal with each other they trust each other right hence the name they drop their prices and they drive out their competitors then once their competitors are out of business they can raise their prices much higher right so any money they would have lost when they dropped their burgers down to 25 cents, they're going to make back really quickly when they raise their burgers up to $6, right? Well, the other thing that Rockefeller did was he used the railroads to get kickbacks. So Rockefeller had the biggest oil company in the country, and he's transporting oil everywhere. Well, how do you transport oil, right? In this time, you transport it on the railroads. The railroads really, 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 really want Rockefeller to use their companies to transport his oil because he's going to be transporting so much oil that he can, they can make a killing on him. So Rockefeller comes to the railroads and says, hey man, I will use your railroad company, but you cut me a break on the prices. You give me a rebate, right? So like if their tickets for transport are, let's say, if you want to transport 10 gallons of oil, it, they're going to cost you $25. He says, well, instead of charging me $25 for 10 gallons of oil, why don't you charge me $15, right? So he's going to be transporting so much oil that they're not going to lose a lot of money because they're going to be making so much on him. And then what they do is they pass that prices on to the farmers. So the farmers might also be transporting cattle or goods, wheat, that kind of thing. But maybe instead of charging the farmers $25, they charge the farmers $35. So you see what's happening here? The common man is paying more and Rockefeller is paying less. Can you see where that might cause some issues? It's going to be a really big issue later um, when we get into some of the issues between the railroads and the farmers. So farmers and railroads don't necessarily get along. Keep that in mind. The last two people we're going to talk about here is Cornelius Vanderbilt and John Duke. So Vanderbilt owned railroad companies. And what he does is something called consolidation. So remember when we were talking about the West, the government did not regulate the railroad gauges. So all of the railroad tracks were different sizes and they didn't all connect very well. So what Vanderbilt does is he goes out and he buys all of the railroad companies. And then he goes and remakes them all so that they're the same width, right? So that means his railroads all connect. And if his railroads connect across the whole country, more people are going to use his railroads. And if more people are using his railroads, the competitors start to go out of business. And when they start to go out of business, he can buy them up for really cheap and then make them the same width as his, and he's got more railroad tracks. 
So this is something called horizontal integration. So whereas vertical integration is you buying out the things you need to make your product, horizontal integration is buying out all of your competitors, right? So you buy all the different railroad companies that you would need in order to make your railroad. So he consolidates everything into one company until eventually every railroad in the country is run by Cornelius Vanderbilt. And if this name sounds familiar to you at all, his grandson is the one that goes on to build a summer cottage in Asheville, North Carolina that is called the Biltmore House. So the Biltmore House, if you've ever seen pictures of it or if you've ever been there, it is a great example of the extravagant wealth that was made by some of these big businessmen during the Gilded Age. So the last guy I want to talk about here um, is a local, right? So this is John Duke. So John Duke was a small tobacco farmer during the Civil War. And when he was, um, when the Civil War was going on, Union soldiers came to North Carolina um, and they found um, this little tobacco, this new strain of tobacco that John Duke and his sons were growing. It was called the Brightleaf um, tobacco. And it was, you know, kind of their own breeding invention. Um, and it was a very mild form of tobacco compared with some of the other tobacco that was out there. So these Union soldiers are in North Carolina, they're smoking this tobacco, and when they go back home, they want to get more of it. And so they start writing letters back down south, like, hey, where can I get some more of this bright leaf tobacco? So John Duke and his sons decide that, you know what, we've got a pretty good product here. We could probably make a lot of money on this product. So they decide that they're going to develop a label. And they call their tobacco the Bull Durham Tobacco. And they start to make icons and advertisements. They put it on billboards, coasters, calendars, pretty much anything you can buy. So suddenly, Bill, Bull Durham Tobacco is a household name, right? So people start going to stores and they're saying, hey, I want to buy Bull Durham Tobacco, right? So there's this demand. Everybody wants it because he's done this really good job at advertising it and people just begging for Bull Durham Tobacco. And so Duke goes to these uh, stores and says, so do you, want to, do you want to sell my tobacco in your store? And they're like, yes, please, we want to sell your tobacco. He goes, okay, well, here's the deal. If you want to sell my tobacco, you can't sell anybody else's tobacco in your store. And the demand for Bull Durham tobacco was so high, stores agreed to it because they knew they could make more money selling Bull Durham tobacco than they could all of the other cigarettes combined, right? So Duke basically has a monopoly on who is selling his tobacco. It's pretty incredible. Um, the, you can kind of think of it how if Coca-Cola went to like Harris Teeter and said, hey, Harris Teeter, you want to sell Coca-Cola? And Harris Teeter's like, yes, we want to sell Coca-Cola. Obviously, it's the most popular soda in the world. And they said, well, if you want to sell that, you can't sell Pepsi, right? So that's basically what he does. Um, and with his money, he decides that he wants to buy a college, right? That's what all the cool kids are doing is buying colleges uh, with all this wealth that they're making. So he decides he's going to buy an existing college in Durham called Trinity College, and he changes the name to Duke University, and that's how that university comes around. Um, that is also, if you've ever been to Durham, you know that there is a Durham Bulls Athletic Park, right? We are still today in Durham, the Bulls. So that's just kind of how the brand of Duke Bull Durham Tobacco has lasted, um, even though it's no longer in business. So the thing with all of these uh, guys here is that there comes a question. Are these guys heroic or are they evil? It's a competing philosophy. And there's two schools of thought. First is that they are heroic. And people who think that they are heroic will say that they are captains of industry. And here's their argument, OK? So basically what they are saying is that this is part of social Darwinism. So in the 1800s, Charles Darwin develops this idea called natural selection, where he says that different species adapt better, right? Oops, my mustache fell off. Um, different species adapt better than other species uh, because they are have the right characteristics to survive. This is survival of the fittest. So this becomes something that is applied to society as well, that the men who make their wealth are better because they are 
have better character, they work hard, they put effort into what they're doing, they're smart, they're cunning, they're, uh, you know, kind and charitable. And so they deserve to keep the money that they're making, right? Because they earned it. And it's actually natural, right? God wants them to do this. But there's an opposite view of this here. So the bad side of social Darwinism is people who are not being successful, well, there's something wrong with that person to make them unsuccessful. They're poor because they're lazy um, or they're dumb or whatever reason. So basically, people who hold this idea blame the poor people for being poor, right? Um, but again, they see this as something that is a natural thing. It's not something that they're just, you know, working towards, it's natural. Andrew Carnegie is a naturally better person than somebody who works for him. Um, this is really like um, encouraged by a series of books known as the Horatio Alger story. So the Horatio Alger is actually the author um, and he tells these stories and they all have similar themes of these young men who come in here and work their way up and succeed because they're you know of good character and they're working hard they're putting their effort into it and so this idea is something that's really kind of perpetuated throughout this um, but the other side of this is these guys are evil and the name that you will hear this is robber barons so basically these men the idea behind this philosophy is that these men are using unethical practices and they're squashing out their competition and putting people out of business and they're not allowing other people to survive and they're overcharging the regular people in society and they're not giving anything back and so this makes them evil. And there's a lot of modern applications to this because this is this kind of thing that's still going on in our society today, right? Um, over the argument about should rich people pay more taxes or because they worked hard should they be allowed to keep their money? Um, or, you know, this idea that what is good business practice? Should people who use unethical practices be allowed to continue? Um, so we're going to kind of keep these discussions going a little bit more in class. Um, but now, now you know a little bit more about all of these different people. Um, so next time you play Monopoly, just try to remember um, if you're going to be a robber baron or you're going to be a captain of industry. Bye, guys. See you in class.